the goodness is coming. Like pay attention, put yourself out there, do the crazy last minute things. I think we wait for stuff to make perfect sense. And I think in the not waiting and the just taking the risks and showing up and saying yes, like you will make it make sense and it doesn't need to make sense to anybody else but you. And my life looks wild and exhausting and crazy for a lot of people, but I'm not living for them. I'm living for me. And that is where I've just seen this abundant amount of joy. In your book, Bring the Joy, every chapter ends with these prompts, the nudge, the choice, and the joy. So we kind of understand what the nudge is. What is the choice and the joy? I spoke about the choice. I think you and I all day, every one of us who's living and breathing, you get the ability to say yes or to say no, to step in or step out, to you know, invest your time here, invest your time there. Whether it's as simple as like, hey, I'm going to have the ice cream or hey, I'm going to have the salad, whatever it is, mm. you get the choice. And I think when you start talking about nudges, these pivotal moments, these things that are tugging at your heart, the voices that you're hearing, like, go move to Mexico City, go try this thing out. It doesn't make sense to anybody else, but it doesn't need to. We get the choice to say, yeah, I'm going to jump in or no, I'm going to stay comfortable and I'm going to watch another show on Netflix. (laughs) And that's where I want you to get good at listening to those nudges, because what I say is, is like the choice the saying yes to the nudge, the saying yes to the scary thing, the saying yes to doing where you're not guaranteed an outcome, like that is where the joy lies. Stop playing safe and in like this little, okay, I think it, like start doing the big crazy things that you dream of. And I'm not saying you have to become super famous or you have to start your own this or do your own that. I'm just saying in your everyday living, you will like be met with these nudges and these choices and how you respond will be what you get out of life. I've got a damn good life. And it's because I'm saying, yes, I'm tuning in. And I'm like, I'm going to bring joy. What do we got today? How are we going to do it? Whether I'm scrubbing a toilet, flipping pancakes for my kids and cleaning up flour off the floor for the 900th time. But I'm finding joy in all of those moments because it is a choice. So let's let's make it real. Can you, can you uh, use the Chad Beach story to illustrate the nudge, the choice, and the joy, and starting with maybe the tattoo, if, yeah. if that's appropriate. Yeah, um, man, it was crazy. So um, Lewiston <laughs> passes away after 179 days, and that's November 22nd. We have his funeral, December the 2nd, and pr- early January, I'm with my girlfriend, and oh, man, I was a, I was a mess. I was good, but I was a mess. And my girlfriend got these really ugly wine glasses for her wedding as a wedding gift. And she's like, you can smash these. I've I've never known what to do with them. I've always just kept them because I felt guilty, but let's use them to help you let out anger. So I'm whipping these wine glasses into the back alley and they're smashing and we're laughing. And then my girlfriend's like, let's go to LA. I'm like, okay, I've never been to LA. This sounds amazing. So we booked this last minute trip and we go to LA, me and, and my two best friends. And, um, we go and I like to go check out churches while I'm traveling. It's something that I enjoy doing. And so we go on this trip and we do our workouts and, you know, your overpriced lunches as one does in LA and we're walking down Abbot Kinney. And I don't know if you know how many coffee shops are on Abbot Kinney, but there's far more than you can count or keep track of. And mm-hmm. what's crazy is my one girlfriend only really drinks Starbucks and she likes like a very sugary latte but we chose to go to Intelligentsia, which isn't like sugary latte Starbucks like drinks. It's like we do lattes. We do, yeah. Yes, we do lattes, we do cappuccinos, and we do traditional cappuccinos. Like, what are you having? And along the wall, as we were walking up, there was lions on the wall. Lions is how Lewiston shows up for me. And like, there's a few different ways that he shows up and says, hey, mama, I'm thinking of you or keep going. You got this. And so I see a lion on this wall and I go, oh, wow, crazy. And I'm literally getting up to the till and I'm like oh I'm like oh my gosh you guys that's Chad Beach and my girlfriends are like what that's who I'm like Chad Beach and they're like have no idea I ditch them in line and I run over I don't even think about it I'm like I just have to go say 
And I go to the guy standing in line. He's got like these very distinct glasses on. I said, excuse me, sir, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. Are you Chad Beach? I just want to, before I go into my story, make sure that you're him. And he goes, yeah, I'm him. I'm like, you're never going to believe this. I just read your book. I'm actually really good friends. I flew all the way out here with my really good friends. I flew out to LA to get these crazy tattoos. One says run towards Aurora. Your best friend wrote this book, run towards Aurora, Levi Lesko. We're here in LA. I got these tattoos and I'm going to your church tomorrow. I can't believe that you're sitting in this coffee shop. And then he goes, are you kidding me? I'm like, no. I'm like, my daughter just passed away. He has a medically fragile child. So his book was all about their like journey and navigation with their daughter, Georgia. It's an amazing book. Highly recommend it. And then he was like, this is crazy. He was like, Levi Lusco is supposed to be in this coffee shop with me, but he decided to take his kids to Disneyland. He's in LA. And Levi Lesko is from freaking Montana, not my, anywhere in Montana, like Kelspell, like the middle of nowhere, Montana. And he's in LA the same time I am. He's like, let's FaceTime Levi Lesko. So we FaceTime him. He doesn't answer. And then all of a sudden we get, he's like, oh, wait, he's calling me back. You know, you swipe on the phone and he's like, hey, Levi, I'm here with my new friend, Jeff. Jeepu here. She's from Canada. Her son died. She got tattoos. Run towards the roar. And he's like, Levi is speaking in LA. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to one church. I'm going to two churches. So we go to Chad Beach's church. Um, he, it was an amazing experience after the service, he comes up and he was like, I was like, Hey, I'm writing this book. Do you have any like, you know, words of wisdom? And he's like, you got a, you got an agent. You need an agent. You got an agent. I'm like, I don't have an agent. I'm like, I'm just getting started. He's like, can you, my girl Esther, you got to, you got me Esther. I'm sending you an intro email to Esther. So he introduces me to Esther from the Fed agency. She's an incredible businesswoman out of Austin, Texas. Shout out to the Fed agency and their full team there who helped edit and make my book come to life. And then after that, I zipped into an Uber and went over to see Levi um, Lesko speak at a different church in LA. And I sat right behind him. It was like just the whole way of how it showed down. And chatted texted the guy who was the usher head usher to make sure that I had a spot and happened to put right behind him even though we were late because of LA traffic and that weekend I was like okay like the goodness is coming like pay attention put yourself out there do the crazy last minute things I think we wait for stuff to make perfect sense and I think in the not waiting and the just taking the risks and showing up and saying yes like you will make it make sense and it doesn't need to make sense to anybody else but you and my life looks wild and exhausting and crazy for a lot of people, but I'm not living for them. I'm living for me. And that is where I've just seen this abundant amount of joy. Wow. I have chills. <laughs> I think it's your energy sharing the story too. That's so, so amazing. So you were born and raised outside of Winnipeg on a farm. Winnipeg, well, it's it's technically St. Francis Xavier, which is 15 minutes west of Winnipeg on like literally we're not in a town. It's just smack dab on the highway and on a farm. And it's, it was an amazing spot to grow up. I hated it growing up. But now that I've moved away, I realized the value and the beauty of what I was gifted as a child. And what was the vibe like um, growing up in, in your house? Jim, my dad was like, <laughs> I think we were all scared of him a little bit. He's a pretty serious guy. He's definitely, I, I know, has softened with age. But like, you did not sleep in during the summer on a Saturday. My mom would be like, kids, dad's coming in from the shop. And it was almost like you get into a tension where you're like, okay, I've already had breakfast. I'm ready to go. And what's the plan? And he would come in and he would give his orders. And as a farming family, there was just like everyone pitched in. Everyone helped. Everyone had jobs. You're over here. You're planting trees. You're cutting the grass. He's helping on the tractor. I'm helping mom. And they were very loving. But I would say my dad is very intense. And he's very assertive and confident. I mean, you could use the word bossy, but he knows what he wants and he knows how he wants it done. And uh, I got to see my parents and my grandparents on both sides be a huge part of our family because my grandfather, my dad's dad had also farmed. And then they had started this farm together. And I was really fortunate that my, my parents had been married for 42 years and both of my grandparents had been almost married for 60. So it was this like incredibly hardworking, you know, nonstop with like a business of the farm, but also filled with love. And what I loved about growing up there was there was always room for one more and everybody was always welcome. And it's a, a lesson that I will take with me to the grave because I think it's really important. What, are, what were you guys farming? Grain. We've always done grain. We only had horses. I got to ride horses. I was in 4-H 
So I was like a little nerd and I did some horse shows and competition, but no, never any livestock or anything. And um, I'm not sure what the economics in Canada are, but I know a lot of farms in the States are subsidized. Were you guys rolling in money or was it like a thing where you were struggling to make ends meet or how, how does that work? My, my like, dad um, worked two jobs uh, up until probably I was in almost high school for sure, mm -hmm. elementary school. So he would truck in the winter to kind of make ends meet. I mean, I remember Christmases where we would get bed sheets. Like I got bed sheets and I got <laughs> made fun of. Yes, Merry was, Christmas. Mm -hmm. Here's some flat sheets and some fitted sheets. <laughs> oh man, I was choked. At, and I, it was grade six. I remember it. It was when you could do the three-way calling, but you could hide that you had a three-way collar because you yeah. didn't have a collar display. Right. And it was one of the things I got bullied about. Um, and it was like very sensitive. So to this day, it's a family joke where it's like, ooh, what are you going to get? Bed sheets? And now I feel like it's like a great gift to give because there's so much in, in bed sheet options. But it was definitely challenging. My, my parents worked really hard and sacrificed a lot to give us a really great upbringing, but it wasn't extravagant vacations. And, you know, it was like wearing my brother's hand-me-downs, shopping trips were limited. And that was tough for me as a female growing up. I think my brothers are super easygoing. I was definitely more sensitive of the bullying and how you would show up and what was important to you. And I can even see that play out in my life now. I'm working on it with my therapist. So it's a whole thing. So you all were very much a salt of the earth type of a family. Um, do you remember any of the philosophies or ideologies that your parents would echo in your house to you and your brothers growing up? Aside from you have to work hard, obviously. I think was it a heavy religious? Like you guys were Christians, right? Yeah, Christian. So I grew up Mennonite and not the type of Mennonite that's like hardcore where you're wearing like the head coverings and no TV. People are like, did you not have a TV growing up? <laughs> My grandparents were Mennonite. So they followed very much the Mennonite traditions of a lot of the baking and the food, all of which I am now allergic to. I'm celiac. My dad is a massive wheat farmer, which is hilarious. <laughs> But in our household, we went to church every Sunday and we went to a Baptist church and a Mennonite church and another Baptist. And now my parents have a non-denominational church and that's translated into my own life. I still go to church um, every Sunday and planted myself here in Calgary. I kind of skip a lot of Sundays in summer because we have a real short summer and I'm not home often, but that like Christian upbringing was what I would call it. And I don't remember my parents ever drinking alcohol until about high school. And to this day, I've never seen my parents abuse alcohol. I've never seen them drunk. I've never seen them overdo it. They're always the first to be a DD or to say, oh, I'm good with one glass. And I love traveling with my dad. If you're at a big conference, my dad will just be like, oh, sorry, I'm an alcoholic. Um, you know, people, <laughs> you know how those people just sometimes don't stop and that shuts yeah. them up real fast. And um, a great line to use if you're sick of people bothering you. But um, yeah, Christian mentality. I think our home, what I know to be true was it was filled with grace, which is unmerited, undeserving favor. And so mm -hmm. a lot of us mess up, all of us mess up. And that's something that they extended. They didn't let you get away with much. My dad would always say to me, stop creating excuses. I just want a solution. Um, and then, yeah, it was a very loving home. A lot of turmoil between me and my dad growing up um, because I think we're carbon copies of each other. And so there was a lot of that. And I'm a challenger as in, on the Enneagram, I'm a challenger. So I'll challenge people, I'll push them. And that was hard, I think, for my dad. And he's a challenger. So then we'd see a lot of this. So um, you also had a bit of a rebel phase, right? You were listening to hip hop music and and kind of rebelling against your parents. And so who got you I into all of that? Cigarettes and, I smoke in cigarettes and listening to DMX. Yeah, like. exactly. <laughs> were you influencing your brothers or were they influencing you? How did that work? No, my brothers, oh my gosh, literally I have like two saints for brothers. My older brother is so studious, full ride scholarships, like brilliant, does his PhD. Whenever I introduce my older brother, I'm like, he's the smarty and I'm the party. So mm -hmm. he's now a professor at the University of Illinois. I called him right after... And it was right before Detroit. And he was speaking at the House of Congress in Washington, D.C. Like that's who my brother wow. is just like he's brilliant. He's an economist. 
um, an economist and he's you know, very studious, doesn't have a lot of common sense. And my little brother is just this peacemaker. So I think my older brother has, was so by the book and he didn't really test the boundaries, but I think that was me figuring out what were the boundaries? How far could I go? What was too far? Um, cause from everything that I remember about growing up, my older brother didn't do anything wrong. I don't think ever. Mm. And, um, how, how did, well, actually, before we get into that, you, you mentioned at dinner that you were teased about some pants mm. you used to wear or something like that. No, what, so, what was that story? Oh, there's a, there's a couple good ones here. I got bullied really bad in elementary school. It started in probably grade four, just with it being a small town and a small school. And I had gotten my pants pulled down in gym class. Mm -hmm. And then they had, uh, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, it was like rotten apples in my shoes. So when I stuck my out of my indoor into my outdoor shoes to go play at recess, these rotten apples just squished up everywhere. Um, and just like always the one to not be included in like Sean's birthday party or like, oh, mm -hmm. Jessica's a loser. She can't watch Simpsons. Like my parents didn't let, let us watch Simpsons growing up. And I was teased and made fun of a lot for that. And so that kind of translated into junior high and, and high school. And it was, it really affected me. I remember my mom would call them long before this was a term, but mental health days. And so she just wouldn't make me go to school because I, I dreaded it. And I had migraines as a little girl. And I think a lot of it might not have been an actual migraine. I think it's just how my body manifested processing all the hurt and the um, turmoil of feeling not accepted and not included and not part of a group. So you couldn't wait to get out of St. Francis, Xavier. Well, what did you see for yourself <laughs> beyond school? Oh my gosh. I, I wanted to move. If I'm being honest, I wanted to move to New York. I was like, give me this big city. Like as a little girl, you'd watch the rom-coms. It was either mm -hmm. New York or LA. I wanted to be an actress, but I, I didn't really pursue it that actively. And then mm -hmm. New York, I just saw like big corporate I thought maybe I'd be a cruise director, or like an advertising agency, you know, CEO, somebody that just was like world domination. And I wanted the hustle and the bustle and the excitement of like driving fast and moving places and catching cabs. And I remember having a vision of wearing high heels in an airport with my roll on briefcase. And um, I remember when I made that happen years later, I was like, whoa. I wasn't quite as big. I was like flying to like random towns in Canada, which weren't as sexy as New York, but it was still pretty awesome. And what was your relationship like with, with those? You talk a lot about a lot now about nudges from mm -hmm. your heart. And how, did you, do you remember experiencing any of that as a younger person, as a teenager, um, having your heart guide you in any kind of way that felt obvious? Yeah. When I broke up with my first real boyfriend, Jeff, um, he was my next door neighbor. He lived about a mile away. I think he's in, in the book and I had to ask him for permission. I said, Hey, would you mind if I shared our story? And he was really gracious and let me use his name and um, share that, that piece of, um, our story. His uncle even brought the book and he had just read it. Um, I think a couple months ago, which was kind of fun. But I remember trusting my guy. I so badly wanted to marry him because all of my friends had gotten married really young, like at 20, 21. That's what you do in Winnipeg. Bless it, Winnipeg. I'm not trying to bash it, but it just felt like, especially in the Mennonite community, to justify having sex, you would get married early. And so you'd get married at 19, 20, 21. And I wasn't, I wasn't meeting somebody. I didn't have a connection. And so then when Jeff and I were on again, off again, I remember just being like, it's okay to let this go. And that was like that nudge, but in my head, practically speaking, I was like, if I let this go, it could be another couple of years before I'd meet someone. And then I'm going to be 25 and I won't, you know, how am I going to have kids? And we're going to have kids at 26. Like that was like mind blowing for a girl from Manitoba in this Mennonite, you know, world. So that's the relationship breakup that ended you up in Calgary with $300. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah what was the plan there wasn't one like I wish I could have been like this is it this is it this is how stupid I was and I think the stupidity and call it being naive that was where the magic lay because I didn't have the responsibility of a family and a mortgage and all that where you could just go and do the thing and if it didn't work out the worst was that your bank account was at zero and you had to tell people it didn't work out but I had two girlfriends we talked about moving to Calgary 
I didn't know anyone else there. I had no set job. I remember applying for jobs because I really wanted to have something lined up. And I was working at a fitness studio, but I wasn't, I loved it, but I didn't love the lack of balance. Like you're in fitness. And I was one of at the most unhealthy moments in my life. And so I was like, I want this oil and gas job. There's all this money. And every time I go to apply, they didn't like that I had a college education and not a university degree. So I wouldn't even make it to an interview. But I just was like, screw it, I'll figure it out there. And the company that I was with had offered me a job in Calgary. They said, hey, we have a job, like clean transition. You do exactly what you do, but you're going to do it at a co-ed facility. I was managing a a fitness club for all females only, and they had a co-ed one. So I went from general manager to assistant general manager. And I think I didn't like the knock and pride of being like, oh, this position isn't the same. So long story short, I declined the job and I moved there. My parents dropped me off. My dad buys me tools as a housewarming gift, which I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, you're only doing that for a farm right off. Like most people buy a TV or like, a, I don't know, none of that. And to this day, I am very thankful for the tools because I still use them to this day and they're very handy. It's a gift that keeps on giving. But I, I figured it out. There was no plan. I just knew I, I needed a change. I needed to write a new chapter in a different city where I didn't have the weight of my previous chapter sitting on my shoulders. I think you can do that anywhere. But for what I knew I needed, I think that was a nudge of just being like, let's start fresh. Because I remember that night I sat on my par- porch on that front step when my parents drove away. And I said, I can be anything. I get to rewrite the chapter. And I didn't have the voices of everybody in my head. And that made it really easy to start and writing a new chapter. What, is, what was the vision for success? Was your priority to get married and have kids? Was that like ultimate success? And then whatever you were doing for work was just what, whatever it was. Or was it to become some CEO or, of something? I think it was both. I think it was like the American dream, right? Like family, kids, white picket fence, but I'm like also a badass boss. Like I'm like CEO, you know, with an assistant and all the things that for me, I had had this vision in my head. I'm meant to work. I'm that creative outlet for me that like leading people to be the best version of themselves. That's how I'm wired and what I know I'm gifted to do. And I just knew I needed to do that in some capacity, but I knew it was my time to shine. I was one of those people that was usually first in the office and last to leave. When lots of people were out partying, I was working and I loved it. I didn't, I don't regret any of of that. I loved working hard and putting in those hours. Was that your dad's influence, that kind of hardworking farm ethic? Yeah, and I, I mean, I get... I, I don't, my mom and dad will probably both listen to this podcast. So then I, I want to be kind with my words, but I saw how much they struggled. It was hard. And you see all these things. I mean, for us growing up, it was in the movies. Now it's on social media, but I wanted to give my kids all of the opportunities. And my parents gave us an abundant amount of opportunities, but I, I wanted even more. And it's a very dangerous slope to go down. So I have to be really careful, but I worked really hard because I didn't want to struggle like my parents did. I didn't want to drive the beat up van that had rust on the sides and struggle that way. And now I'm being honest, I drive a car that has 300,000 kilometers and tape deck in it. I'm like, okay, it's just a car, whatever. Like you don't need the shiny object, but I wanted some of those things that I'd seen in movies growing up. So you were having a conversation one day with a friend of yours from church about a list of things that you wanted to do and didn't want to do. I guess you were in between some of your jobs. Yeah. Can you talk about that conversation? <laughs> we're going to go there. I always, <laughs> whenever this comes up in a, a podcast or on stage and I'm sharing a keynote and people are asking questions, I always say um, you have full permission to punch me in the face. But what I, the reason why I share this so openly and why I put it in the book and I think I'm being so vulnerable is I want to help other people know that you can say something. It can be terribly wrong and offside and really hurtful. And it's Mm -hmm. okay. It's okay Mm -hmm. that I made a mistake and I said a really horrible thing. And so I share this vulnerably and people are welcome to judge me. I didn't know what I know now. And so even in this world of like culture of judgment and harassing, and I'm reading the Will Smith book and I shared that on stories and someone's like, oh, Will Smith, he's horrible. I was like, he's horrible because he said one bad thing. Have you looked at the list of all the good things? Like we expect perfection from people. And what I know to be true is is I hope no one ever expects perfection of of myself because I will let you down every single time. 
but this conversation was pivotal in my life. And it, I said some horrible things. And I, I said that God has a sense of humor. Cause he's like, Oh, little girl, I'm going to show you a thing or two. So I'm driving to church with my girlfriend and I'm so frustrated because I live in Calgary. It's a boom and bust city. We're in a boom. You know, people are literally making 50 bucks an hour, picking their nose, just sitting in a cubicle. So you're like, anything is possible in this city. This is legit what happens in Calgary. So I'm like, I, I can pick my nose and look good while doing it. So how have I not found this amazing career and job? And my girlfriend's like, what do you know you want to do and don't want to do? Let's just start with a pros and cons list. And the very first thing that I blurted out, I said was, I know I would never want to work with handicapped kids because they disgust me. And I don't remember her response or whatever, but then I think I just kept going through the list of here's what I know, here's what I'm good at, you know, as one does when you're kind of sorting through things. And then cut to a week later. Week later, I I volunteered at the church quite a bit. And my girlfriend was like, got a call from someone like, hey, we're short in Sunday school. Do you know any friends that have already done their criminal record check and are approved to, you know, volunteer in the church? Could they come and help in Sunday school? I was like, yeah, for sure. I've got nothing going on on a Sunday morning. Happy to help. So we get there and they're like, you over there, you over there. And they're like, you over there with the five and six year old boys. So I was like, okay, sounds good. I'm over there with five and six year old boys. And as I walk towards like the, um, classroom I see a little boy and he's sitting in a wheelchair and his hands are too weak that he he's stuck he can't roll and play and if anyone's ever seen five and six-year-old boys they are filled with more energy than a friggin' rock chip and so mm-hmm. they are like circling the room and rounding and I went straight over to him and not even remembering this conversation but I just said hey can I push you around so we can chase the other kids and he said yeah that'd be great and I was chasing the other kids and it was crazy. And I'd be chasing him so fast in his wheelchair, his head would fall over and his head, his neck, you know, was very weak. And he'd go, um, excuse me, Miss Jess, can you pick up my head? I, I can't pick it up. And so I would literally take my hands to his head and I'd get it back straight. And I'd be like, okay, I'm driving the wheelchair too fast. And the rest was history. At the end of that, I felt this nudge. This is probably when I really started paying attention to nudges. And this voice was like, Jess, you got to go tell this family that you help them that you'll just, you know, whatever it is. And so I wheeled a Sean to his dad where he's picking him up from Sunday school. I said, Hey, I'm Jeff. I swear I'm not a criminal. I've got a criminal record check. I'm a super nice person. I just love to help and serve your family. And, um, their dad was like, yeah, okay. Amazing. Great. He's like, my wife's coming. Can you just wait to meet her? And I was like, sure. I've got nothing else to do. And as his wife walks around the corner, she is also pushing a wheelchair with a little girl who's four years old, whose hands are too weak to push. And I introduce myself, say the whole spiel. And she says to me, how soon can you start? And I was like, I can come tomorrow. And so that was the the rest is history. Truly from there, the next day I showed up and I, I nannied for the family. I helped the family. I learned to love those kids and nothing about them disgusts me. I Um, grew so much as a human and I learned so much about myself and gratitude and um, it was a wild ride to where I'm at today but it was a pivotal moment in my life of you can say some really crazy things but it's also okay to learn from those crazy things okay so I have a few questions about this moment Mm -hmm. for you Um, yeah question number one those those two children were experiencing what's called spinal muscular atrophy so right. what, what does that mean in relationship to the body and the brain and all of that? Mm-hmm. So spinal muscular atrophy, also referred to as SMA in short, is a rare genetic disease. And essentially the easiest way that I understand it to be, you can go Google it and get a much better medical explanation is, but they're missing a genetic, a genetic gene that's passed on from both parents. And that gene that they're missing is the gene that's pivotal in telling our nerves to reproduce. So when nerves die off, as they do in every human body, they're being reproduced. But in a body that has SMA, they're not reproducing. Nerves are what communicate to our muscles. So you want to like move your leg. Like I just crossed my legs and crossed them. You know, I don't even think about it. I just do that. That's because my nerves are communicating to the muscles of signals to the brain. But when they die off, you can't do that anymore. And in um, patients and families, members, those living with SMA, they'll start to lose that ability. 
And so these kids at about 18 months were diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. And so they started losing the ability to walk. And then you started losing the ability to use your hands and arms. And it eventually kind of works its way up your body until you can't eat, breathe, swallow all of those basic human functions. Like you and I are breathing right now. I'm talking right now. I don't even have to think about it. I just do it. It's that natural. I can move my arms up and down, side to side, clap, give you a thumbs up. And for that, those simple motions for someone living with SMA, it is a terrible amount of work. And then often they'll fully lose that ability. And that's why Ashan and Shania were so weak at four and six that they, they had already lost the ability to communicate and to be able to use those muscles in their arms to push their wheelchairs. Is there a certain amount of time that doctors give someone who's experiencing SMA? So Ishan and Shania at their diagnosis, which was about 18 months, so a year and a half, almost two years old, the doctor said they probably wouldn't make high school. Excitingly enough, Ishan and Shania have both graduated high school and are in university now and kicking butt and like literally world changers. They're the coolest humans. I love connecting with them because I always learn something. They think I'm an absolute, you know, gong show with a capital G. Just ask them. They're just like, it's never a dull moment when we're together. For um, others, um, you know, getting diagnosed at birth or a few months old, it's usually death before the age of one. And then you'll have people live into their 50s and 60s. Mm. They say that there's about four different types and type one being the most severe and type four, obviously not being severe. And in each type, there's varying levels. There's not like a cookie cutter of like, oh, you're type two. Like we know some really strong type twos that can like lift up their arms and try to pull a sweater on. And then other type twos that can barely move the joystick on their wheelchair or can't bring a spoon up to their mouth. So mm -hmm. you've got varying degrees of severity. Okay, so you mentioned that you felt a nudge to go up to Ishan's father and volunteer to mm -hmm. help. What was that nudge? What is it? What does it feel like if you had to articulate that? Is it a? Is it a? Are there words saying mm -hmm. just go up, or is it just a feeling, or what is? What is that nudge? For me, it's a combination of both. But I feel really blessed. My nudges are usually very audible, like. Uh -huh. And when my husband, now to this day, I was like, shit, honey, I got a nudge. He's like, oh shit, here we go again. Like, it's like, buckle up. Like, you got to go do the thing. And he's like, oh man, what is this going to do? And usually if I get a nudge, you better watch out because it's going to happen come hell or high water. Um, and often they're very crazy. And, and sometimes I don't always get to see the end result of it. I'll follow the nudge and I just trust it. But it's an audible voice. And it's almost like something's tugging at your heart, like pay attention. And that part, I, I'd be curious. I think that happens for all of us. I think it's just, and you would know, I usually don't stop talking and shut up because I'm like, I want to know this. Tell me about that. What about this? Like I'm at, like my pace in which I run my life is like high vibes all the time. And I love it. But I also know that I have to be quiet enough or smart enough to listen to that. And I think that is wired inside all of us. Something I've written about, because I talk about nudges a lot as well, is, is you know, people say, oh, I don't know what my heart is saying. And, and part of me is saying, responds with, you, you be careful because when your heart does nudge you to do something, it's usually not something that's going to make you more comfortable. It's going to be something that mm -hmm. that stretches you to some extent. Would you would you um, agree with that? I would. Because it's not usually the comfortable stuff. I don't think we need to be nudged to do comfortable stuff. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like your body already knows. It's the scary, uncomfortable, you're not guaranteed a result. That's where the nudges are like, low, pay attention, go do the thing. And you're like, oh God, it's scary. I don't want to do it. I don't know the outcome. What, if, what will people think of me? And that's usually where we got caught up. And my whole book was about like, yo, pay attention. That's where the frigging joy lies. Every nudge, respond. It's crazy, but it's also really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So speaking of crazy and, and stretching ourselves, talk a little bit about a day in the life of of helping to care for these two young, beautiful souls with SMA? Oh man. I mean, this is where I get choked up because I think, you know, you're like, oh, brush my teeth, brush my hair, go take a piss. Like I, I, you, I wake up and the very first thing you go pee, that's me. And then mm -hmm. I brush my teeth. Those are the very first two things that I'll do and shut it off my alarm, right? And I don't have to think about that for one second. Mm -hmm. But the very first time I cared for them, it was like, 
Jessica, can you come get me out of bed? And they had to wait for somebody to come and get them out of bed. They're so weak. And so it starts with, you know, getting them on the toilet, brushing their teeth, but you're doing all of that work for them. And the crazy thing is with spinal muscular atrophy is it doesn't affect your cognitive thinking. You're still very with it. They're some of the smartest people because they're so tuned in. Um, but physically, that's where they would face all of their challenges is, you know, not being able to physically do something. So you get them ready, get them in their wheelchair. They have power chairs, which are incredible. And so once you're in a power chair, depending on what age you are, you're fairly, I shouldn't use the word fairly, you can be somewhat independent. Again, depending on the severity of, you know, spinal muscular atrophy that you're facing, but it's everything from like breakfast. And it's like, Sean and Jenea are um, 21 and 19 and someone still has to cut their food for them. And then towards the end of the dinner, they get tired in like lifting a fork. And I remember purchasing my cutlery, you know, when you go and you get a wedding registry done and you pick it all out. I remember weighing out the different um, like cutlery options and being wanting to make sure that my cutlery was light enough that they could use it which is crazy. Cause I don't know a lot of people that you're like, I usually you pick it up and you're like, wow, this is really weighted. It must be good quality. And those were things that you don't even think about. And so it's everything from every time they have to go to the bathroom, every time they need their nose wiped, every time they want like their hair. Okay. Can you just like, I'm like, Oh, quickly I'll throw out my hair, you know, boom, put in a pony. You're like, okay, good, ready. Let's go boom. And whatever. We don't think about those things, but every movement has to be calculated and sorted through every meal. When you're going to sip water, who's going to be there to take you to the bathroom? And there's some cool surgeries. You can get what's called a metrophenoff surgery where you reroute your bladder through your belly button and you can self catheter. But if you don't have that and the kids didn't have that until they were almost 18, every time you want to go to the bathroom, every time you want to do something, you're making sure that someone's there to assist you in every step. My favorite part of caring for them was at bedtime. I would play this crazy dentist lady named Helga or Olga. And then I would play the dentist with them. That would take 45 minutes. And then once we got them into bed in pajamas, all the things I would get to pick their nose. So, you know, you probably like blow your nose, but they didn't even have the strength to like really blow their nose. So I got to go on with a Q-tip and pick their boogers. And I just thought it was the best thing ever. And Sean would roll his eyes because I find great joy in booger picking. And it's like, that's the stuff you and I don't even think about. It's like, you got something, you just finger up your nose and away you go. And it's, it makes you realize like now when I look at it, I'm like, golly, everything I do is a blessing to run and jump and skip and play. So when you would leave their house every day, would you feel exhausted or would you feel grateful or was it a combination of just a lot of different feelings? I remember that first time I left their house, I bawled. I bawled because I think like all fitness and working out, but I was like, I didn't even have to think about walking down two steps and mm-hmm. opening my car door and not having the strength to do that. Mm-hmm. I didn't even have to think about that. My legs wouldn't work. And I don't think many of us play through that scenario. And I was 22 at the time, something like that. And it was the first time that I was like, Whoa, I'm so damn grateful for my legs. Like I've been gifted something, such a blessing that I've taken for granted up until this moment. And I think Mm -hmm. unless you have kind of a life altering circumstance, I think so many of us live like that. Oh, whatever, I'll work out later. Oh, it doesn't matter if I move or whatever it is. And it's like, I don't take those moments for granted. And so I remember being overwhelmed with, I think it was a bit of guilt. I think a bit of shame of just like not realizing like such simple gifts that I had and feeling, you know, bad for taking them for granted and then full of joy because for me, I could have fun of brushing someone's teeth and picking their nose and being like, Hey, this is a small way that I can show up for somebody. And I wasn't doing it for anybody. I was just doing it because I wanted to make those kids smile. I wanted their mom to not be so stressed out, to not feel um, like she didn't have help. And that's, you know, massive thing that anyone with SMA is navigating is getting the assistance and the help. And I remember the first time I cared for them overnight, they were up, I think it was 12 to 14 times. Can you roll me? I'm too hot. Can you roll up the curb towards my ears? And I have little kids and they're amazing sleepers, but I know when you're trying to help your kids sleep, it's like, Oh, getting up again, but 14 times. 
And not because, but they just, their body hurts. They need to roll. Like you and I are rolling back forth, sheets up, sheets down. And I just remember being utterly exhausted after doing it for, I'd looked after their kids for a week. The mom and dad went away for a trip to recharge the batteries. And I remember being like, they do this every day of their life. There's no break, no tap out. They get one vacation a week for seven days. I was like, they're wired different because this is next level. Mm -hmm. How did this experience evolve or influence your, your idea of success? For yourself because you're 22 years old i mean you're most women your age or most people your age are thinking about making a lot of money and you know being famous or whatever what were you I, thinking i'm in terms still of thinking success? about those things <laughs> <laughs> at that time yeah you know what i learned i learned that you could show up where you are so i started working for this company called jugo juice and i was the director of operations and training Mm -hmm. and the, we were a smoothie company. So similar to like a Jamba juice or whatever. And so franchise partners would buy the location and I would onboard them and train them. And we had a full on training facility. And part of um, what we would do is, you know, you train on how to make the items, but part of what I incorporated was like community outreach. And I was like, y'all like we can show up and use this for a difference, like for good. And you like seen Tim Hortons, that's our coffee shop here in Canada. Like they have like camp day where it's like buy a coffee and like the money goes towards sending kids who have camp, who have cancer to camp. And I was like, okay, this is amazing. And so in the training, I started encouraging franchise partners and I would do, we did, I think three events before I was no longer able to be interactive in the training. And I kind of took on an, a bit of a different role but we would run a community outreach event, invite people into the head office where we were training, and then we would raise money. And the first thing we raised money was for adaptive bikes for these kids. And to see community and goodness and people who'd never met these kids, they weren't there. I just showed them a picture and said, hey, we're raising money. I mean, I had a guy at the end of the day, he was like, Jess, what are you short for these bikes? I was like, I don't know, probably another thousand dollars. We'll try and hold another fundraiser next month. And he was like, I'll just write you a check right now. Mm -hmm. And that was where I could see that I believe in any situation, big business, big corporation, a small business, you know, a mom and pop shop is that you can give back and show up. And sometimes it'll be to write checks of millions of dollars and you don't even have to think about it. And other times it's raising it, you know, dollar by dollar, penny by penny to raise adaptive bikes. And that's where I really saw I think in my corporate world of wanting this like CEO type position and, you know, take charge. I wanted to inspire people that even in a corporate job, we could still do good and serve the community. And that was accomplished then. And that's transitioned into what I do now. Okay. So you, that's where you met hot Ronnie. In, in that is where I met hot Ronnie. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you, you will go into great detail about this in your book, how he had a girlfriend and you had this guy from Costa Rica who you were thinking Carlitos. about dating and Carlitos yeah. and you secretly wanted hot Ronnie. And so just give us a little synopsis of how all of that play, all of that played out. Here's the shortened version. And this is like the encouragement. Because here's, the here's the other good thing is that, I mean, the other important thing I want to, I want to express is that you weren't just, you weren't mother Teresa. You still wanted to be in a relationship. You still wanted, you know, to have a family and all of that yes. while you were taking care of these other kids. Yeah. Well, they knew I could, like, I just, for me, it was like a no brainer. It was like, I have all this time. Like I don't have kids of my own, like how I can of course serve and show up. And I had that desire very much. So to have my own kids and a husband and you know, that white picket fence, blah, blah, blah. So I meet hot Ronnie and we're working together and I'm like, holy shit, this guy's hot. I don't know if you can swear on here. Pardon me. If we can't, you can bleep those out. But I was like, dang, this guy's hot. And then after working with him for a week, I was like, he's an asshole. He's a jerk. Like, woof. <laughs> and he was short and I was short and we never were friends. We are at the office late one day. And like I said, I stayed at the office late all the time because I didn't have other things to do. I volunteered in church and I did some other stuff. But I, I was like, I saw opportunities of where to go. I created my own positions. I told companies what they needed to do. And so I loved working. So it was often that I would be at the office late. It wasn't often that you would ever see hot Ronnie there. He'd peace out by four. And so we're at the office late one night and I had asked him, hey, are you okay? And he goes, no, not really. I was like, okay, again, this nudge on my heart to be like, ask him how he's doing. And in that question of me saying, hey, are you okay? 
he shared about he had this drug overdose with his girlfriend and they got drugged and he kind of made up this BS story. And he was like, I'm really struggling. So what I do, I go back to my faith and I was like, Hey, if you want to join me at church, feel free to join. And often when you invite someone to church, they're like, hells no church be crazy. Cause they've grown up in really whacked out churches with crazy rules and really bad taste in their mouth. And like everyone's jerks and two faced. And so you're like, I don't want a part of that. And he legit was like, yeah, I'll be there. And I was like, holy crap, this is uncomfortable because I'd been turned down more times than I had been like accepted the offer. And so I was like, oh, and then that like booming voice, the tug on my heart was like, ask him to the Good Friday service. And that weekend was Easter weekend, which is a big deal in the Christian faith. And so I was like, I'm not asking the hot guy to church twice in one weekend. That is way too much. He's going to think I'm a Bible thumper. And the voice boomed at me again, being like, ask him, like, you have to do this. So uncomfortable. I like muster up the courage, kind of close my eyes. It's almost like I felt like if I closed my eyes, like he wouldn't see me. I was like, hey, you can come to church with me on Good Friday if you want. And he goes, you go twice in one weekend? So I explained the whole thing about Easter and long story short, he came to church. He was a total mess, struggling with mental health, massive addiction issues that he had kind of kept under wraps from all his family and friends for a really long time. He gave his heart to God. We started becoming friends. He just needed someone that was like chill, didn't drink, party your face off and do drugs, which I would stay at the office late on a Friday night because that's what I did. And So he was just like, so you just like, don't go clubbing on a Friday. Like you don't go out and drink. And I'm like, no, like, why would you do that? Just wasn't my scene. And so we became friends. But while that was happening, I had started this romantic endeavor in January with this um, Costa Rican white water rafting guide that I was like, okay, this is it. I have to marry him. I'm going to start an adventure company in Costa Rica. That will be how I climb the CEO ladder. I'm just going to own my company. It was a whole thing. So long story short, um, the Costa Rican guy ends up coming. I end up telling him I'm not love. And Ronnie and I, the more time I spent with him, the more I fell in love with him. And anyone that will meet him to this day, he was a punk for, I'd say, a solid 10 years and a little bit of a jerk. But the who he is to the core has always been great. And he has the most incredible heart. And he's servant hearted and humble and kind. And I fell in love with that guy. And so I like confess my undying love to him three times, three times. He's like super great, but we're just friends. And then eventually um, he caved or I just warmed down from harassing him. I don't know. He can tell his own version of that, but we started dating. And then two years later, I was like, tick tock, buddy, tick tock. Either we're in it or you're out of it. And he was like, I'm out. And we broke up for a bit. And then he was like, oh, you are kind of the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. It's exhausting for him, but here we are. Wow. <laughs> so throughout this whole process, are you still volunteering with Ishan and his sister? Yeah, um, I made I made Ronnie. I was like, Ronnie, we're taking the kids to my parents' farm for an extended long weekend. He's like, what? I'm like, Ishan and Shania, the kids in the wheelchair that I help out every like kind of random. It obviously was like way less than what I did when I first started seeing them. Mm-hmm. But I was like, hey, their parents need a break. We're going to fly them to Winnipeg and we'll hang out at my parents' farm because it's an awesome place to be. And how many people get to go hang out? And so we flew them to Winnipeg, which is a whole thing because you got wheelchairs and all their extra luggage and Um, He did that with me twice, which was really incredible. And um, we still would show up and take him to movies and out for dinners and just fun stuff. I had a friend going to pilot school in Ashan when he was little, wanted to be a fighter pilot. And so when he was getting his hours in the plane, I asked if if he could take us up and we pretended to do a fighter mission. Ashan got really motion sick and from that moment on decided he never wanted to be a fighter pilot again. So I was like, I crushed a dream on his birthday, but. Um, it wasn't the same capacity. I think it goes in the seasons of your life, but they've always been a part of it. They were our flower girl and ring bear at our wedding, which is really special. So what did you notice about hot Ronnie? <laughs> everyone I calls call him it and he loves it. I know everyone does. And he loves yeah. it. I'm like, what guy doesn't want to be called hot? Like, <laughs> right. What did you notice about hot Ronnie in the way he interacted with them? When you, when you kind of, I guess, I'm assuming you enrolled him into it. Did he get to a point where he was, well, did he start off just doing it because he thought that's what you wanted him to do? Or was he, was he into it? That's a great question. I have never been asked that. I mean, I would say, what do they say? Baptism by fire. Is that the Mm -hmm. right way to say that expression? I think when you hang out with me, 
and this is like, whether you're married to me, whether you're my friend, you are just like, you, you become part of the, I call it the Jessica vortex. Like once you're in, you like, if you can't keep up and you don't want to do the things and like, you're just going to be left in the dust. And so I think for him, that was kind of how it was. It was like, Hey, we're picking up the kids. Cause we're taking them to a movie and dinner um, on Friday night. And like, there wasn't even an option. Like it wasn't, and I respected, like, if he was like, Oh, Hey, I have plans or I'm busy or whatever. It would be in our later years that it became um, some stuff we had to work through in therapy for sure of just like, why did we have our own diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy? But he, he jumped on and he's always a really good sport. And I think he knew how much it meant to me. And what I would say is he's probably uncomfortable as everybody is Like you don't want to hurt them. They're really frail. You can break their bones really easily. They're not like hefty, solid built people. And so it was, I'd be like, okay, just pick them up and put them on the toilet. And I'm just like, we'll figure it out as we go. And he so like wanted to be safe and not hurt somebody. And so he was very like sensitive and I would say cautious. Um, but he was right in there. I think partly because he knew he didn't really have a choice. You know how you had that feeling of, of overwhelming gratitude after you first started doing that? Did you share that with him? Like, would you guys sit in the car after, after um, spending time with him and just talk about how grateful you were for everything? Yeah. And I, Ronnie's a very physical guy, you know, very healthy and, you know, he had to be after his addiction. It's one of the things that is of his highest core values is his health. And I think it just even opens your eyes that much more to ensuring that while you have your health, take care of it. And that was just a, like another thing for him to add to his bucket of why it's important to, to take care of himself. Mm. what's your proposal story because it was kind of funny <laughs> oh my gosh so I I gave Ronnie an ultimatum because we had broken up and I literally <laughs> said because I'd done this with Jeff and I remember we so romantic again. I know right but I mean this is the stuff that you think it looks like Hollywood movies and it's like that is not how life works out this is the reality <laughs> so he breaks up with me and in that we were working together. I was living with him. He gives me his keys and he was like, move out. I want you out by the end of the night. And ironically, we just had this conversation. I said, he said to me, why didn't you even try to call me and fight and be like, Hey, can we work through this? He's like, you just took my keys and started packing stuff. He's like, you know, I'm reasonable. And I would have listened to you. And I was like, really? Are you kidding me? I slept on a friend's couch for four and a half months. Like you're telling me this now. But we had broken up and I was so firm in like, if you want to get back together, know that, that I'm going to be your person because I don't want to go on and off, on and off. At the end of the day, life is about choices and we get the power to decide what our choices are going to look like. We can say yes or no, in or out, up or down. And so I was like, if you're in, be all in. Because my parents, I'd, I'd seen them work at it for 42 years and it wasn't just blissful, romantic, no problems. I'd seen my grandparents do it for it. Like, it's a choice to show up and be with your partner and do the hard work. And so when he came back to me, he met me at, um, his truck was parked at the Jugo parking where we worked and I had left my car there because I had flown out for a wing that he was supposed to come with, but we had broken up so he didn't come. And he had this incredible letter I, I carried in my wallet to this day just about saying, Hey, like you're the person. And I feel like I'm going to fall short because you have insane expectations, which is like, if you've met me, yes, very true. But he also said, I'll spend the rest of my life doing everything I can to make those expectations and to give you a life that you dream of. Cause I have crazy big dreams. And I knew at that moment that like he was all in and it was the security and the reassurance that I needed that no matter what storm we'd face, that we were in it together and he didn't have a ring. And he said that he's like, I don't have a ring, but I'm going to take you to New York. And I had this dream of wanting to go to New York or be a CEO. And I'd never been to the city. And so he booked this trip and took care of all of the arrangements. And it was beyond perfection. And when we were in New York on the second night there, he took me out for a beautiful dinner. And then we walked to um, the carriages at Central Park and we get into the carriage and he climbs in and I climb in and you're clopping along. And I'm like, holy, this is it. Like, you know, your heart's beating out of your chest. 
And we literally were in there for two minutes. Ronnie hands the driver of the carriage $200 USD. I get out and I'm like, did you just give the guy $200 USD? He was so nervous. He couldn't calculate the bills. And so he just like, and you could see like the guy in the carriage was like, yeah, like take off before the idiot tourists realize how much money they gave him. And then he whips down his pants and pees on a tree in New York. And I'm yelling at him. I'm like, you are not peeing on a tree in Central Park. And then he proposed over the bow bridge. There was nobody around. It was like lightly misting. And in typical Jessica Jansen fashion, I try to rush everything. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah. I wouldn't even let him say what he was trying to say. And he proposes. And then the next thing out of my mouth was, did you get me the ring I wanted? And I mean, kind of hilarious and crazy. And he's like, did you legit just say that? I was like, well, did you get me the ring I wanted? And it's not even like that outrageous of a ring. I'm wearing the bands right now. It's just two simple bands and then this other diamond that he got me, but it was amazing and more than I could have asked for. (laughs) And then cut to you all are having your first child, Mm -hmm. Swayze. Swayze, we have Swayze Grace. I was told by doctors I couldn't have kids, celiac, endometriosis, all these crazy stomach issues. Um, I was heavier. I didn't have a, a regular period. My cycle was messed up. I was in constant pain. I've done a lot of work in my health. I was, um, I got mono and hepatitis and a liver infection when I was in high school. And it took me, I would say eight to 10 years to recover from that properly. And now I take really good care of my health because I know how quickly it can fade. So we weren't sure what it would look like, but we got pregnant with Swayze on the first go. It was crazy. And she came and then uh, four months after she was born, I peed on a stick again. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're doing this again. And Ronnie had started a new business. I wasn't really working. It was wild. That wasn't kind of what we were preparing for. And so it came fast and furious. And literally 13 months later, almost to the date, our second son was born, Lewiston. And we also have a third little guy, Hollis, who was born in 2019. So Um, mm -hmm. so when Lewiston was born, did you have any feelings or anything about Lewiston that made it stand made him stand out from your experience with Swayze none his birth was easier like it was like I literally went into the hospital and this is I legit how the story goes down I walk in I'm like hey me again you know you check in I was like I was here 13 months ago let's get this done and they're like okay we'll see we'll triage you I was like I am for sure dilated because I waited a really long time you know they awkwardly stick their hand up your woohoo and they like look off into the distance you've probably I don't know if you've had to deal with this with any of your family but they'll Mm -hmm. measure you and they're checking to see how dilated you are and they're like oh wow you're six centimeters dilated which is pretty freaking far along I was like yeah let's have this baby I get into the room and I'm like all right team here's how it's going down I'm like break my water gonna go in the shower and when I say push it means I gotta push because when I start pushing this baby's coming out and they're like okay and I was like I know you got a scheduled c-section there this morning doc but I'm gonna happen before the scheduled c-section so buckle up let's get this done before you go do that and they're kind of laughing and but taking me seriously because it's your second baby they broke my water and 45 minutes later I was like I gotta push and it was three pushes and Lewiston was out And literally they rushed me out of the delivery room. You don't stay in the room in Canada. You move from the room to a different unit. And anyways, it's a whole thing, but I was home that same, I delivered him at 8.55 and I was home eating gluten-free cheese pizza and watching playoff hockey at 6.30 at night. Like it was just like, okay, that wasn't so bad. I'm like, I'm sitting on a padsicle and, you know, I'm a little bit of pain, but I just had a baby. This is great. And family was coming over. Like there was no like, resting mother's bliss it was like the playoffs were on and it was Ronnie's team and we're always hosting so come on over nothing would have alerted me for what we were about to embark on and you mentioned and maybe I'm getting this wrong but you mentioned a chiropractor first Mm -hmm. detected that something was off so why were you taking your son to a chiropractor So Lewiston had um, really bad colic. So a colicky baby is literally like crying, screaming all the time, like just nightmare. You have to constantly be moving. And I was really the only person that could hold him and soothe him. Like most babies like, oh, you're so content. He was in, like he, you could even see he was in pain. And so I tried everything and a bunch of friends that we had just hung out with. She suggested my kids had colic, take them to this chiropractor. I'm in Winnipeg at my parents' farm. We're holidaying there. And so this is where my girlfriend said, so she's like, my kids went, I was like, great recommendation. And when I put him down on the little bed and I unzipped his sleeper, his skin was mottled, but he was labored breathing. 
But as newborns, he's two months old at the time. They're just weird alien-like creatures anyways. Like they make weird noises. They make weird sounds. They're pooping 12 times a day. Like you don't know which way's up. I'm sleep deprived. And she didn't even treat him. She just said, I want you to take him to emerge, have him looked at by a doctor. And I thought it was really weird. Again, still not panicking. On the way, I stopped for a gluten-free sandwich. I stopped for a hot Americano. Like I called my mom. I don't even call Ronnie at this point. Cause I'm like, oh, I don't want to, he's a little bit of a worry wart. I'm like, I don't want to alarm him. And I just remember being so perplexed, like this kid kind of looks fine. Like what would be the issue? And I literally went from the Cairo to the sandwich shop and the hot coffee to emerge and into emerge in Canada. Like, unless you're dying, you typically wait quite a bit of time. And blessed be, I was in a private room ready to go. Literally from that private room, a nurse was like, we'd like to, you know, just move you to a different area. And I remember putting Liston back in the stroller, like strolling over thinking, oh man, I haven't even had a sip of my coffee yet. This is really fast. And looking up and just seeing the words resuscitation room. And that's when everything for me flipped that I was like, oh, this is serious. And I was able, um, after we got our diagnosis with Liston, I was able to thank that Cairo and just say, thank you. You probably saved my son's life. Cause had he fallen asleep, you know, a certain way or his head, he probably would have cut off airway and not had the strength to adjust himself like most babies would. So it was a blessing to be where we were at the time. So what happened next? Once you went into the respiration room, when did they give you the diagnosis? So seeing out of Gray's Anatomy, you know, people are running in, shouting numbers. They've got lights on. They're calling. We need a CT and MRI. Um, we want an EKG and ECG. And I'm like, what's happening? And so the team's, you know, counting um, and checking on his vitals every 30 seconds. And we're moving to an MRI over to get a CT. And I call Ronnie. He had flown back to Calgary because he had to go back to work. And he got on the first flight that he could. And we spent six days in Winnipeg at their children's hospital with no answers. You meet with geneticists and, you know, vitamin specialists and geneticists and their neurologists and their cardiologists. And they're like, oh, maybe bacterial infection could be a vitamin deficiency. We're not seeing anything. And there, um, somehow I decided to call Karen and she, I said, is it really hard to test for spinal muscular atrophy? And she said, no, it's just a simple blood test. And so we requested it to be done in Winnipeg. And they were like, oh, you know, we really don't think it is SMA. So we don't want to do it. And they're like, we don't have a lab here. So you have to send it off. And we we're both like, do what you have to do. If you need to charge my credit card, charge my credit card. Like, just get the test done. Because the mm -hmm. doctor, the neurologist said to us, I'm 99% sure it is not spinal muscular atrophy. And we high five. We're like, whew, dodged a bullet. Hopefully he's just like a little slower or doesn't have the same muscle tone. And they drew the blood work. It never got sent off from Winnipeg. We could fly back to Calgary after we get discharged in Winnipeg. And we just didn't have peace in our heart that we didn't have an answer. And so we went to go see our doctor who the children's hospital, I asked for a file to get transferred from Winnipeg to Calgary. They transfer the file. We get a call and we go in that very same day. And that day we got admitted and we redid all of the tests. And some of them are pretty painful. They're not very fun tests to go through. And um, we redid all those tests. And on August 5th, the doctors walked in and handed us papers that said spinal muscular atrophy. And I was so naive. I, I was like, okay, okay, not so bad. We got this. I was like, okay, like, I'm like fast pass Disney. I'm like, as if you're in a wheelchair, you just right to the front. You're just priority. I was like, I'm going to get all the prime parking. Cause I now get the blue little handicap sticker, like beep, beep, here we come prime parking. And then the doctor could tell that I wasn't getting the severity of this. And she had that piece of paper discussing the different types. I didn't know after caring for Sean and Chenea for almost nine years, I didn't know the severity and the different types. It just didn't, I don't know, call me naive, blonde, whatever it is. And she said to me, she goes, Jess, like this is spinal muscular atrophy. We're waiting for the confirmation from the blood test, but we don't think that Lewiston will make his first birthday. And we don't have treatment. There's nothing we can do. Our, our role here will just be to make him comfortable. And those <laughs> words, when someone says, you know, there's nothing you can do like that for me, there's always something you can do. So that, that hit me really hard. And you and your husband 
hot Ronnie, you made a pact that day. What was your pact? We said to each other, we said, this will either make us or break us. We had just um, navigated the loss of his dad in a tragic car accident in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> was driving home and never made it home. And we didn't have answers. And um, my husband's got a wild and crazy story. His birth dad had passed away at nine and there was never any answers for him. Um, you know, they lost his body and it had washed up on shore from a fisherman in the Bay area. His dad was a, a, a horse jockey that had rode in the Kentucky Derby kind of a crazy story. Cause Ronnie's six two and his dad was five, four and he didn't have answers. And so when his dad got into a car accident in Mexico, we re worked really hard to uncover the answers. And it was just a lot in our first year of marriage. And we were talking about divorce and separating because it just felt like we were cursed. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if we leaned into we're cursed, all these bad things keep happening to us, we probably would have thrown in the towel. And um, I wish we knew now what we know that I wish we know now what we had known back then. And we, we don't, but it served us so well to have gone through so much hardship. And I just remembered in hardship, it usually wants to break people apart, but I also believe it can make people. And so I just was like, we have to let this make us regardless of the outcome. And if we fight in unity and together, that unison will be what keeps us rock solid because it is really difficult to have a conversation with your partner to say, do you want to do more breathing equipment? Do we want to do an invasive surgery where he might die or there's no guarantee he comes out from, but it ultimately could save his life. Do we want to try and raise mon money and fly around the world for treatment, even though there isn't really any yet? Like those are the conversations you have to have. And if you're not on the same page or willing to listen to the other person's feelings and their thoughts and their concerns, it will just drive a massive wedge. And they say, when you have a medically fragile child, the divorce rates just skyrocket because there's so much more to navigate than even in a normal marriage. And so we made that pact because Sean and Shnea, the family that I'd cared for, their parents did get divorced. And so I saw the living proof of how hard it would be and I knew how hard their journey was to no one's fault of their own. It just adds one more thing that you got to work through. And I wanted him on my team. How did you spiritually, how did you reconcile this for yourself? Are you, are you a believer of destiny, fate? Um, was this coincidence? Like what, what was that conversation like in your own head spiritually? <laughs> I think we talk about how faith and, you know, people's experiences of the church can be really messed up. And I had a lady that told me that because I did yoga and I welcomed un, you know, welcomed spirits into my life, that this was God's way of punishing me. So oh I've heard it all. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, okay, because I was getting bendy on a yoga mat, God's condemning me. I was like, that ain't the God that I believe in, but okay. And she was like, you need to pray this prayer. And at this point I'm praying whatever prayer I can pray. Cause you're throwing up a hail Mary every which way. Cause you're like, I don't want my kid to die. And I still battle it out with God of like, could you not have taught me a lesson in a different way, a little less hard, a little less hurtful, a little less painful. But then I also reconcile all of the goodness that has come because of the hard thing. And I am a better person for it. And I tell people, I said, what shocks most people is I said, the, the death of my son is one of my biggest blessings because I live life differently than a lot of people do. And I've learned to keep my eyes on my own paper. And it was my son in his fight for his life that taught me those lessons. And so as much as like, sometimes I'm angry at God being like, oh man. But what I know to be true is that I've radically accepted what's happened to me. And that radical acceptance piece is it, it's happened. And I don't need to reconcile to God, curse me or punish me or condemn me. I don't believe that a loving God, the God that I believe in is that kind of God. Well, Jessica didn't, you know, tithe enough here or she hasn't served enough. Cause I was like, I literally was like, God, I've served. I've like in my twenties, I was like not going out and partying. And I'm like, why couldn't the asshole on the street? Like, why couldn't his kid die or the murderer's kid, you know? And you think all these crazy thoughts. And to this day, I don't believe God makes bad things happen to people. We are given um, free will and choice. And I believe that this has just happened to be the cards that I'm dealt. 
And I believe that goodness can come from it. And living in that place has lifted a weight off of me. And I don't sit in the why me. I sit in the so now what. And you had just raised $45,000 for new wheelchairs for Ishan. New, and- new wheelchairs, accessible van. I have the picture in my phone. And I'm just like gobsmacked at like at the bank, raising money. The first fundraiser only did $630. It was just as like GoFundMe was starting to catch on. And then we started GoFundMe and we did all these things and fitness fundraisers and people donating. And um, then three weeks later, my own son gets, um, you know, really low tone and in the hospital and we get our own diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy, which is a rare genetic disease, which had you heard of before you met me? Mm -hmm. No, I did not. So, and nine out of 10 people that I meet, 9.9 people that I meet have never heard of it until they hear our story. So was the fundraiser, the fundraisers, plural, um, was that the inspiration for going public on Instagram with Lewiston's battle? No, on Instagram, I shared, um, I, the reason why I went public with Lewiston's journey on Instagram was because I felt like a blog was too complicated. Like, it wasn't like, it was way more like you need a little bit of coding and you couldn't just upload a quick article now that you can, when you update a website, Instagram was the easiest way for me to update people in general, because I couldn't keep up with the text messages and the inquiries. And so by saying, Hey, here's where we're at today, or Hey, here's the next doctor's appointment. And anyone that would ask questions, we could just refer them to this one spot that there was a picture and there was what was next steps. And so that's why we started sharing. And I just knew that we would need help because I saw how I was able to give help to Karen and um, Sean and Shania and their dad, Pradeep. And I just knew that I would need to accept help too, to lighten the load. So let's talk about that. Um, because obviously when people hear tragic news, you know, they want to help. What is, what is the kind of help that someone is finds useful who's in your situation? And what's some help that someone that may be a little too much? I wish there was the perfect canned answer for this question, because what I will say is based on my experience and what works best for my personality and mm-hmm. my love languages. But what I want people to hear in this is if you know someone going through tragedy, through death, through grief, through a hardship, is trust your gut listen to it. If you have an idea, when you show up out of love, that's the best way that you can walk alongside somebody. So I think it's chapter 18 in the book. It's called leave the chili at home. Someone dies and you either get a lot of friggin' chili or a lot of lasagnas. (laughs) My best friend got diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. She got 22 lasagnas in one week dropped off. And the very first thing that her a medical team said is don't eat red meat. And every lasagna is filled with ground beef. So, but what I know to be true is I was like, no one's showing up with the lasagna being like, oh, hopefully this is not helpful. And now that I'm going to fill the deep freezer. Every person that showed up with the lasagna was just like, I don't know how to help you. Here's an offering. This is me sharing, sharing and showing you that I love you. Mm-hmm. And so what often happens, I think, is we overthink it. We're like, oh my gosh, what if they don't like those type of flowers? Well, what if they don't like fresh cut up veggies or they don't like the salad dressing? Nuh-uh. Whatever you think that you can do to help somebody. And I just say, picture yourself being in that situation and what would you want? So now when I show up for stuff, it's like, can I take your kid for half day? Because I know that I would want help with my, my kids or just a break. Can I send a cleaner in? Oh my gosh, let me send in a cleaner. And Lord knows not everyone loves scrubbing their toilets. Like they're going to be there Thursday at noon. If that time doesn't work, can you give me two other dates that do work? Mm-hmm. But when we just ask the question, hey, let me know how I can help. We're in grief. We're in tragedy. We're in loss. We're too exhausted to be able to articulate what we want, what we need, what would be helpful. So just show up, take out the guessing game and don't worry, don't worry about it being perfect. That's the best solution. That's the best way to help someone alongside them. And I mean, I got a lot of damn chili. I I don't like chili that much right now because I got a lot of it, but I love every single one of those people that brought me chili because they brought it because they love me. And like, they didn't know that I was going to get 19 more buckets of chili, And how cool is it that someone took time out of their day when time is our most precious commodity to walk alongside and say, I love you. I think Mm -hmm. access service is a great way, but I would just say, trust your gut, 
give from your heart and then let go and let God. And so Lewiston uh, blessed you with 179 days in this uh, lifetime. And you mentioned in the book that the way you were able to sort of cope with the grief personally was through things like therapy, um, ex- honest expression. What are some of the other mm-hmm. things that, you, you, that helped you kind of not move on, but just move through that, that time? Physical fitness, I think saved my life. I was a fitness instructor. So continuing to move, especially when I, like my own son had a disease that robbed him of movement of his body. And I'm gifted with that ability. I can't say enough good things about it. Reading, getting curious, going on adventures, challenging myself, saying yes to insane opportunities last minute, showing up. And I used Instagram as I think a personal grief journey therapy book. Like I literally would almost journal online Mm. and that for me was therapeutic. I don't think that there's like, do these five steps, do these six things and you'll be through grief. And you know, it's not going to hurt as much. I just know like what I need and what I need is I need to feel heard and listened to. And I felt that Uh, I wanted to not have emotion bottled up inside of me. So I got to release it through fitness or getting together with friends and being active and on the go. And then I feel really good when I'm accomplishing things. So business goals, uh, giving back goals, helping other people. And I think one of the biggest keys to not being stuck in grief and staying under the covers with the blinds drawn is using service is blessing other people and serving them in their hard stuff because I don't know a single person that can serve and show up and give of their time or of their heart and then feel bad after it you're like man I could just if I could just help somebody this much it's worth it and that was a a massive part of my healing journey of just helping other people filling in the gaps and um, I'm a helper so I love doing it yeah I want to talk about the foundation you set up but before we get to that one more question about this period of um, moving through the grief. Talk about, and again, this is not a one size fits all answer, but talk mm-hmm. about your marriage. What do you, what were the things that you noticed in your marriage that helped you all together sort of deal with this, cope with this? Mm-hmm. Marriage is hard. Relationships are hard, as we all know, <laughs> you know, whether it's with your family, your girlfriend, your partner, your wife of three years, 10 years, 40 years, you're navigating a partnership and then you're navigating a personality and brain wiring. Like I love neuroscience. The more I dig into it, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, Ronnie's not trying to be an idiot. His brain is just wired differently than mine. Like an aha moment in our marriage was he has, we have barbecue tongs and the barbecue tongs have a little pin so that they are stay tight and aren't open. He sticks them into the dang dishwasher open and then you can't put more cups in there. And I was like, are you kidding me? He didn't even think. He didn't even think to close the little thing and so that they don't take up as much space. And him and I are rolling on the ground laughing because I'm like, how big of an idiot are you? But his wiring, like my wiring is about efficient, effective, and his wiring is as fast as possible. And so when you understand how your partner's brain is wired, you're like, oh, you're not intentionally trying to piss me off. That's just how your brain works. And my brain works totally different. But now because I understand yours, I'm not going to like jump on you and like chew your head off for something as silly as, as dish tongs. And I used to do that where I would just chew him out and grind him and, and just be in his face and nag. And now with this, like understanding the work that we've done in therapy, learning to like listen and not explode when he doesn't like agree with what I want or what I'm thinking of, or one of my crazy vortex insane no ideas that's I've been nudged on my heart. Detroit was a prime example. I had this opportunity to go to Detroit and I knew I needed to tell him. And then I knew I needed to just let his response sit and marinate because less than 24 hours, his initial response was like, how the hell are you going to do that? You're an idiot. We're going to go bankrupt. This was not part of our plans this year. This is way too big of a financial investment. Like I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. Another one of Jessica's just flipping ideas to the next morning, he was like, I support you. I love you. If this is the step that you need to take for your career, I fully support you. But previous to all of this, I would have just been like, you never support me. You don't love me. And so what I know to be true is, is in grief and navigating loss, hardship, disagreements, different dreams, different goals, 
is about listening and understanding where they're coming from, how their brain is wired, how they like will receive love and what that looks like. And the first two years of our grief journey, he had a lot of built up hurt from his past and then also from the deaths of his dad. And for me, grieving looked like service, acting, going places, traveling, getting out of the house, doing all the things, starting the foundation, giving back, showing up, helping people raise money. Da, 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 da. And for him, it meant like clinging tight to our daughter and being safe in our home and not, you know, being very careful with our time. And so we butted heads a lot. And what I learned was, is like his journey isn't better. It's just different than mine. And my journey isn't better. It's just different. And so through that and, you know, a couple acts of absolute rage, I've thrown a pot at his head. It's smashed in the garage. I don't have a good aim and whipping like a rice maker at him. Um, Cause when I get angry, rage builds up inside of me and I could just like go nuts. So realizing that a lot of situations are really just about miscommunication. And when you seek to understand and slow down, that's where you can navigate a whole lot better when you're working through grief with somebody. And so I would just say, slow down. I'd say, um, seek to understand and stop jumping to conclusions. And we both continue to do therapy. We let out a lot of hurt and Ronnie really resented a lot of what I did. And when he finally shared that with me and why he resented our foundation and all this time, it helped me understand his hurt and what it meant to him. And so that was the biggest thing was really, learning about what the other person needs and what their journey is like, rather than trying to make their journey exactly like my journey, because that will just pull you apart. Mm. And then on Lewis's first birthday, you all had an idea or your friends had an idea or they asked you what you wanted to do. What what was that conversation? Mm -hmm. I don't remember who it was to this day, but we basically someone said, hey, Lewis, I want to say it was my girlfriend, Kirsty. And she's so good at checking in on all the dates, but she knew Lucen's birthday was coming up. And she said, Hey, what do you want to do? Just like, let's be proactive about this. And I said, I don't want to sit at home and have a pity party. I want to have a dance party because that's what we did in the hospital. We knew that we couldn't change his outcome. And when the doctor says, Hey, we'll only be able to keep your son comfortable. I was like, okay, comfortable and fun. Okay. Comfortable and joyful like comfortable and not like morbid death because that's what we are facing. And so I wanted that to transition into his birthday party. I just had this desire um, to raise money for the hospital and we weren't in a position where we could just stroke a check for 10 grand. So I was like, let's raise 10 grand and give it back to the hospital. So let's have friends and family over and we brainstormed all these crazy ideas. And that night it was absolute case. We had no idea what we were doing. It was so stupid. We raised 42 grand and that just snowballed. I was like, okay, if we can do that in a night, what's stopping us from raising a hundred grand? And that snowballed into, we're almost at $1.6 million raised since Lewiston's first birthday and he'd be six. So, and in your personal checking account, you'd have $70 and then you'd have like a million in this foundation account. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I can't wait to go on stage and share like, Hey, my bank account is now in a healthy balance. If only people knew, but Um, it's been so challenging in our marriage and in what we do in business and how I juggle business and running a foundation. That's a charity that has a board of directors and a charitable license that I don't take lightly. And people are entrusting you with sometimes thousands upon thousands of dollars. And we're just really proud of the work that we can do. And I go back to the quote, the fastest way to get there slowly And so this whole vision of what I have for my life, I know that I'm right where I'm meant to be. Would I have wanted it to happen faster and have more financial freedom? Sure. Who doesn't want financial freedom? But if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I know that I'm living my life on purpose and no one's going to talk. I've got a good life insurance policy, so my family will be fine. I might, (laughs) might even serve them better, but I just feel like. I know that I'm living on purpose and no one in a eulogy or at a funeral or a celebration of life has ever talked about a bank account balance. They've talked about impact. They've talked about legacy. They've talked about how you made them feel. And that for me, far outweighs the number in my bank account. Yeah. I feel like your example is especially poignant because of that. And, um, and it's, uh, and it's just a it's just a really great example that you don't have to be 
Rockefeller, you know, or one of his heirs to have a charity or to help people or to raise money. And that's been the whole point of this podcast is to highlight people just like yourself, mm-hmm. who's, you know, a relatively, you know, not a celebrity. And Definitely not a celebrity. You're, you're doing you're doing the most with what you have. And I feel like people don't give themselves enough credit to understand that they can you can do something about the things that you care deeply about you can it it may not be on the level of oprah winfrey but and you never know you can do something it's got to start somewhere and um oprah started with nothing like but i think what we the problem and why people don't start or they're scared to put themselves out there is they see the rockefeller they see the big checks they see the oprah winfrey moments And they forget that like she's been putting in 20, 30 years to be able to be like, you get a car, you get a car (laughs) moment. And for me, I will say it was scary to start because you're like $630. And people are always like, how do you do what you do? And I almost tell people, I'm like, don't expect this to be a cakewalk. Stay the course, show up, do the hard work and stay consistent because that's where the magic happens. And and for us, that's where the magic has happened is, is that we've just kind of continued on and it hasn't been big and flashy from the beginning. It's just been these small little like drops in the bucket to compound to where we're at. Now, I'm very excited to say we've worked really hard. 1.5, almost 1.6 million. Like that's a big deal. But I was also really excited about the 42 grand. And I was also really excited about the check that not a lot of people knew about because I knew it mattered and I knew it was important. So, so I think that's a good place to. To end the conversation, leaving them wanting more. Because <laughs> you do write about all of this in your book. Yeah. And, um, and as we were speaking before the interview officially started, it's a really good book. And uh, it's called Bring the Joy and came out in 2020. Mm-hmm. And um, it's inspiring and inspired me. And, and I think just hearing the full story in this way, it, it, it definitely leaves you wanting to, if you haven't already been of service, you definitely want to start to be of service in whatever way speaks through you and, uh, and, and definitely follow those nudges. And, and, um, and just put yourself out there a little bit more. I think that's what we all could use some of is just putting ourselves out there a little bit more. Mm-hmm. My hope and my prayer, I think if I can close with this, is the way that you show up is how you are truly gifted and it doesn't need to look like me or look like life's journey but I want you to trust yourself and then to stop living for the approval of other people's opinions because when I was able to shed that off that's when I stepped into the fullness and the abundance not caring if Chad Beach was excited to see me or that he'd be think, who's this crazy wacko? Or like when I, I don't even know, I was, did I ask you for dinner? Or did you ask me for dinner? Or we were just kind of, it just kind of snowballed. But I was like, if a guy says no, he doesn't want to have dinner with me. I'm not going to have my feelings hurt because it doesn't mm-hmm. ma- mean anything about me. I don't know his day or his path or his journey. So I would just encourage you who's listening to this is shed the weight of other people's opinions and judgments of you because that's all it is. It's their opinion, their judgment. Step into the fullness of who you were created to be and then watch the beauty unfold. Be present. And the energy that I put out is the energy that I get back. And I cannot say it enough of like, those vibes are what fill my cup and keep me going. And it's like, okay, what's next? What do we got coming up? What's the next chapter we get to write? Because I'm gifted it. You're gifted today. You're going to be gifted tomorrow, Lord willing. And so I'd say, don't be idle on the sidelines, playing small, play the game. You don't know how long you have. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on. Love you. Thanks for having me. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.